Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our first panel, Strategies to Remain Competitive in Global Markets. Our moderator is Stephen Perlstein, Pulitzer Prize-winning business and economics columnist for the Washington Post. He's joined by Ursula Burns, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, Xerox Corporation, Michael E. O'Neill, Chairman, Citicorp Incorporated, Citicorp, Neera Tandon, President and Center for American Progress, and General James Jones, former U.S. National Security Advisor and retired U.S. Marine Corps General. Good morning. Um, my name is Steve Perlstein. I, I am a columnist at the Washington Post. I'm also a professor at George Mason University, uh, which is actually where I spend most of my time these days. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a privilege to be here again, um, as, as some of us were last year, to uh, be at this conference. And we have a, a, an interesting panel. Um, you know Mike. Mike is uh, going to, his pay is doubled today because he's doing two of these sessions. Uh, so uh, two times zero is uh, still zero. This one I prepared for. Oh, good. <laughs> we don't have to fill in. We don't have to fill in for, uh, for Larry Summers. Right. Yeah. Tough right. job. Tough. That is a tough job. So um, we're here to talk about competitiveness. Um, and the format is that I'm going to briefly introduce um, each of the speakers. And the speaker is going to briefly introduce what subject uh, uh, he'd like or she'd like to talk about. I ask them each to focus on one thing about competitiveness. Um, and we'll go back to each of them and have a longer conversation. You each should feel um, free. As a matter of fact, will you guys in the end sort of move in a little bit so we're a little more can see each other? Um, <laughs> feel, feel free to uh, um, jump in and ask questions uh, of each other, because um, I'm not the only one uh, who has questions. Um, so we'll start uh, just uh, on my left, your right, is Ursula Burns. Um, Ursula joined Xerox Corporation as a summer intern in 1980, and uh, it's safe to say she's moved all the way up the ladder. She's now chairman and chief executive. Uh, she's also vice chairman of the President's uh, Export Council. Um, uh, next to her is uh, uh, General J James Jones. He's the former commandant of the Marines and head of uh, military forces in Europe. He was national security advisor uh, to President uh, Obama, and he at one time worked for an arm of the Chamber of Commerce uh, working on energy issues. Um, to my right is Neera Tandon. She's uh, president of the Center for American Progress, a, shall we say, a center-left uh, think tank in town. Um, she worked in the Ob in the, on Obamacare a, at the Department of Health and Human Services as an advisor to uh, Secretary Sebelius, and she uh, at one time worked on the Clinton, um, the Senator Clinton's presidential uh, primary campaign. And Michael O'Neill, you know um, very well now. So let's um, start with, uh, with you, Ursula. What is the one thing, if we were to focus on competitiveness, what is it that you think we ought to focus on? What's and the one thing? Normally I would be speaking about education, but I'm going to not, not do that today. I okay. think I'll put down my hat as the vice chair of the Export Council and speak about how exports, exporting our goods and services around the world in an effective way will drive our competitiveness. And that's what, that'll be the big thrust okay. of my conversation. G General Jones, what's the, what's the one minute thing that you want to um, focus on? Well, for me, I think it's extremely uh, important to realize uh, uh, just how the, uh, wor the world of energy uh, figures in our future. Um, both from a competitive aspect, uh, but also from a national aspect. And I think while there are many solutions to our problems, I think one of the bright shining paths that we should follow is, is the energy path um, in, in rewriting, rewiring uh, how we look at energy, how we think about energy strategically, and how the United States leads uh, throughout the world on the, uh, the energy potential. It is just uh, uh, really one of the bright things that we have to look forward to. Great. Neera? Uh, I, w I think the most critical element in my mind is human capital. I think Ursula referenced it with education. Um, but really looking at education from 0 to 22, 25, uh, and that the United States is facing increasing competition. 
uh, from uh, even Asia and other countries that we traditionally didn't see as competitors in higher education. And so I think that, that, uh, that element of our education system and lifetime learning is critical to long-term competitiveness. Okay, and Michael? A variation on your theme, I'm afraid. Uh, <laughs> Maybe I won't. Glad I went first. Yeah, <laughs> I won't have to say much, possibly. Uh, I think uh, what I'm going to focus on is, is talent. Uh, basically, how do we uh, educate, train, develop uh, our citizens? Second, how do we attract and retain uh, people from uh, overseas that come to the come to the United States to work? Uh, that often have big contributions to make uh, and that uh, frequently are unable to stay because of policy issues and, and, and other factors. Uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, enabling that talent to actually achieve objectives. That's what this conference is about, but that's a critical third leg of it, obviously. Uh, so it will be much the same here. Talent, 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 is, in my view, is the key. OK. So um, Ursula. Um, uh, you know, uh, we're doing pretty well in exports, at least the last few years, as was almost inevitable after a recession, things, a global recession, imports and exports go down. Now imports and exports are going up. Um, so uh, problem solved? Not at all. I mean, if you look at um, when I joined the President's Export Council and uh, the President laid out a goal of doubling exports in, in five years. The progress we made in year one, 2010, our exports grew about 16.5% plus, 16.7%. Year two, 2011, 2011, they grew at about 14.4%. Lo and behold, we, we're feeling pretty good about it. Yeah. Uh, 2012, they grew at 4.4%. 4 so the trend is slowing if we don't fundamentally change. And, and I think the reason why the trend is slowing is that we've captured some of the low-hanging fruit, some of the easier things to do some trade agreements signed, mm -hmm. some infrastructure change. But there, in order for us to meet the goal and to continue on double-digit expansion, we absolutely have to fundamentally change the way that we address this problem. I mean, we have to um, think about the enablers, so a broader set of trade agreements, um, broader enforcement um, and serious enforcement of those agreements. Enforcement so that, so that we can get into markets that we are now shut out of for reasons that aren't purely about a trade treaty, but sort of things that go beyond a treaty. Exactly. What, what's happening around the world is, as we are changing the game, the world is changing the game, US leading, leading this portion of the discussion, we sign trade agreements and countries figure out another way to actually limit exports. They have protectionist rules mm -hmm. about uh, what indigenous uh, invention rules, a lot, of, a lot of issues around trade. So we have to actually have the agreement side, have a serious enforcement mechanism, which we are improving, which is good so that you actually follow the rules. And if you don't follow the rules, basically you are out of the agreement that we actually have penalties. And then third, that we have an infrastructure, a broad-based infrastructure to enable us at home to be able to be ready to sell around the world. And this has to do with infrastructure. It has to do with education, a big, big piece mm -hmm. of it. So the, the, entire, um, inf the entire system, the system that makes trade and exports work has to be moved up, stepped up one another notch for us to get to continue this double digit growth that we have seen. I want to go to the question about enforcement because it's been um, a real dilemma for um, the United States uh, and the business community. The business community in particular says, geez, enforce these agreements, open these markets. We have a lot, of, we have a lot to sell, particularly in the area of services. Um, uh, and we're not getting into, into the <coughs> foreign countries. And so, you know, other countries do what they do, they slow, they drag, they have informal ways of keeping us out, and it's time to get tough. And basically, the way to get tough is to say, well, you know, if you can't let us come into your markets, we're not gonna be able to let your stuff come into ours. And then the business community goes crazy, oh, we're for free trade, and you're violating the spirit of it. I mean, right. if, you're not, if you're not willing to play tough and take, you know, take some hits, um, you can't really enforce these things. Yeah, and right. so you know, when, when, how are we going to resolve that? Because we never really get tough with anyone except a little bit the Chinese. 
the, this cannot be handled or managed by an individual com country going alone. There, and I think in the past what the government expected, what the infrastructure expected was that somebody is wronged or sinned and they would actually lead the charge. That alone is too risky for an individual company to do. So they just an individual won't. company, company, of, company, of company, sure. company to do. So one of the things that the Export Council um, works on, and one of the things that the administration helps with, any administration can help with, and this administration is helping with, is for us to have force behind our words. So coalitions of countries, of companies, that will go against a country if there is intellectual property violations, for example, mm -hmm. in in software, intellectual property violations in in the entertainment industry. So having a coalition with the government standing beside us will allow companies to be more brave and more forceful and actually step out a little bit. Without that, it will be silly. It would be silly, economically silly for a company to stand alone. But, so it's not possible. But when you say, does that mean like file a complaint with the WTO? With the WTO? That, but the WTA wor works very slowly, so we have yeah, to I kind noticed. of figure, figure, figure that out. It takes 10 years to get <laughs> right. something through the WTO, as you know. So we're working on all of these mechanisms. How do you get the WTO to work? more swiftly? How do you actually streamline the rules? How do you actually be more public and together? So this is business and government to actually go forth and, and be clear that yes, this is a violation. And if you're not willing to play by our rules, we'll, we'll take our toys back like you take your toys back. Right, well, we'll do that kind of well, thing. Well, General, oftentimes, um, asking you to put on your old hat, so the, the business community is right. We're going to have to get tough with company, uh, country X. And then it comes before you know the, the president's inner circle and the national security advisors. Oh no, you can't do that because you know we got this thing going with them with the army or the drones or this or that, and they're helping us with terrorism. So we can't do that. Um, how do we resolve that question? Well, I think that we are in a new world, and and the uh, the aspect of our competitiveness is really a center stage of our national security policy. And. Uh, so it's not just about, uh, as it was in the 20th century, just about the Defense Department and a little bit of the State Department and the National Security Council. Everybody else is on the outside looking in. We have cyber security concerns. We have economic security concerns. As a matter of fact, one of the things the President asked me to do with the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of State was to go up to Capitol Hill and talk to the leadership about the necessity for export control reforms. Um, I think we have to move. Uh, we have to move major pieces in our structure of our government, so that uh, American business is, in fact, uh, brought into the, uh, if, if you will, the Situation Room, uh, on the same level as other issues. And we have to have uh, bad actions towards us have to have consequences. And one of the things I've learned in in uh, in, in, in the last decade or so is that. Uh, there is an, a, a, a real affinity for American um, private sector involvement, generally speaking. Uh, but at the governmental level, uh, we are still not where we need to be, I don't think, in terms of helping American business succeed. Far from it, far from it. But the, the good news is, as you said, General, that there is a place now being made at the table for us to at least participate in the conversations early. And, I don't know how other export councils worked, but this one, I'm, I'm actually surprised that we actually do work. We actually meet with the administration, we meet with the State Department, we meet with all of the sectors, all of the government agencies to make sure that they understand and that we work together to actually move the ball forward. This will not be easy. We're not gonna just say, okay, now we're gonna be forceful against China tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But I think that as we, we'll make small steps, incremental steps every, day to actually make it, more e make it easier for business to do business around the world, for U.S. business to do business around the world. Okay. Um, let's turn to one of our human capital types. <laughs> um, uh, Nira, so what is it, um, so education. Mm -hmm. Everyone's for education. Um, everyone knows we have an education problem and we've been talking about it till we're blue in the face and we're making some progress but I wouldn't say anyone is very happy with the pace of it. So how do we get out of this rut? Uh, you know, I think uh, there are a few things. The U.S. is making some marginal improvements. Um, but I, I think if you learn the lessons from around the world, there are, there are unique challenges to the U.S. education system. So if you look at what's happened in Finland or, uh, or other nations. You know, Finland has one of the best education systems in the world. It actually doesn't pay teachers dramatically more. Um, uh, but they, they really think of uh, teachers and education as, you know, I think almost like business leaders. How do you attract the top talent in 
society to become, to do their best in the classroom. Uh, and one of the things they do is they provide teachers a lot of autonomy in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And so I think as we're, as we're thinking through uh, what we do in the U.S. education system, I actually think we should learn from the private sector more uh, in terms of education because, you know, in, in, most of our, in most of our private sector, most of the private sector in most areas in U.S. life, U.S. economic life, when we are professionalizing a field, we give people more autonomy and more accountability for success. And so, um, I think that's that's you know when you look at when you look at our higher education system, which is the best in the world, that's a lot of what we're doing. So I think that's a a big set of challenges. One report we recently did at the center was on how China and India are ramping up their investments in human capital. And one 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 thing we found is that. By 2030, China will have more college graduates than our entire human, than our entire workforce. So, you know, we have to, and they are very much thinking about how they, how their workforce competes on high-skilled manufacturing against our workforce. Um, you know, and innovation in a variety of areas. So, when we think, I think the debates in Washington become very sterile and partisan. You notice. <laughs> Uh, not just in education, but when we're thinking about uh, how to move forward, um, you know, I think we're we're competing with countries that are looking at this, looking at education as part of a whole suite of areas in which they're much more economically nationalist. When you talk about China and exports, one of the issues that that raises is, you know, China is moving Asia to compete in a much more economically nationalist way. It's using its power of the state to compete in the economy. They're thinking about their education system that way as well. Mm -hmm. Their education system is an asset of the state to make them more competitive over the long term. It's not just about making people happier and good citizens, it's about making them good competitors for the U.S. and the world. And you don't think we do that? I think we actually, we, we shun thinking about education as a partnership between the government or anyone. You know, we don't think strategically uh, about education as an economic issue um, and a national ed economic issue. Uh, there's a lot of uh, partisanship about, you know, the federal role around education right. and, you know, what role we should have in terms of even what we should test, et cetera. So I think that, you know, I think that that, that core belief becomes much more difficult. It's much more challenged in a world where uh, countries are, are competing on a different plane. So. Um you're, you're associated with the left side of the political spectrum, so let me ask you this question. Um, you know, we're centrist on many issues. I know, I know. Well, you're like Obamacare and left. You're on the right right now. Yeah, that's right. true. So, uh, would, do you think that liberal Democrats and the teachers union would accept your formula, which I thought was a good one, autonomy mm. plus um, accountability, the two mm -hmm. A's, right together. Yes, you, you, we're going to give you more autonomy. You want that? Fine. You got it. But here's the accountability, and uh, we're going to be pretty tough about that. Would uh, you know? Well, so I can't speak for everyone. I would say I can't. You know, we would obviously at the Center for American Progress. But I would say, you know, right now we have we are creating accountability mechanisms that are. Rigid. Uh, that originate undermining autonomy. Right? Yeah. So to me, it's like, how do you get the best person in the world in a business? How do you get the best person? Like, how does Google attract engineers? How does, how does, how do you attract business leaders? You know, you have he to get them. them through money. <laughs> uh, that's you know, I, I, okay. I understand. You might want to look this way. It. You might want to look at it. Ursula because <laughs> I know how he attracts them. <laughs> Uh, well, I think that part of the reason people get more money is because they can make individual decisions. They right? make a lot they of can autonomy. They can be accountable for those decisions. So I think as we navigate uh, greater systems of accountability in our education system, um, I, I worry that we are actually, uh, you know, we are, we are repeating the industrial model in the 21st century in education when we actually need to move to different models where individuals have, uh, individuals have autonomy over their classrooms, but they're accountable for results. And I think actually, 
uh, many on the left would support that because right now they have accountability and no autonomy. Mm -hmm. At least that would be a step up. Okay. Um, the other big issue in education is choice. Um, that uh, students and parents ought to have be able to take their public money, essentially their voucher, and be able to go to um, any school, public, mm -hmm. private, um, and th that sets up a competitive dynamic. Are, are, we, are you in favor of that? Well, you know, I'm in favor of what works, and we found that, that every analysis that's been done of private school charters, even public school charters, although I'm a big fan of public school charters, um, you know, they haven't shown positive results. Uh, you know, some of the charter schools are showing definitely positive results at the state level, but when you look at broad studies, I don't think, uh, I think we should do what works, and I would be totally open to these models if they, if they succeeded, but so far we don't have evidence of them succeeding. Okay, so General, let's, uh, you wanna talk about energy? Um, fracking is uh, gonna save us, right? Well, I don't know that fracking will, but, but, but certainly uh, responsible technology with the, with the right um, science and uh, done by people who are responsible uh, is certainly a, a viable option. And so uh, uh, what would you do, uh, what else would you do in energy to, to, to stimulate our exports? I mean... Well, the, the first thing that, uh, that I think needs to be done is to recognize uh, that we are malorganized as a government uh, to handle uh, strategically the concept of energy. We, and we have just finished a two-year study. I've had uh, co-chairs uh, in this study with the Bipartisan Policy Council, co-chairs Trent Lott, Byron Dorgan, and, and Bill Riley, former EPA administrator. So balanced, uh, All good guys. bipartisan, mm -hmm. and, and, a, and a very, very good representation of the entire energy spectrum sitting around the table for the better part of two years trying to come to, uh, to grips with what is the strategic path for the future. So the first recommendation, uh, and the one that's I think most substantive, because if, if we don't do this, we're gonna be right back where we were. We have not had a strategic energy policy in this country for the last 40 years. There, there is no such thing. The Department of Energy, the Secretary of Energy, and this is not a criticism, this is a fact, is not the Secretary of Energy, he's the Secretary of Nuclear Energy. So, in my view, the, the, the best thing for the President to do is to, is to organize the executive branch so that energy is dealt with with one single point of, of responsibility and accountability, and that's the Secretary of Energy. Just as, a, as the Secretary of State handles foreign policy, Secretary of Defense, defense policy, we need an energy okay, so, policy. So I have two questions, oh, go ahead, go ahead. So, so that's, that's, it's really important to say that because if you don't have a strategic point in our government that is responsible for bringing together the 15 or 16 different agencies that have a lot to say about energy and the 30 to 32 oversight committees on Capitol Hill, you're just, we're just, we're just not gonna get there. So point one is that's extremely important to do. I think you should have a, a senior director in the National Security Council for Energy Security. I think we should have, uh, we, we also think we should have a, an energy QDR, so to speak, quadrennial defense, mm -hmm. quadrennial energy review. We, we advocate for um, uh, the fact that we need all of our energy. We're not, it, it would be a tragic mistake to say, oh, we've got uh, shale gas and, and shale oil, and so we're fine. We don't need to do anything else. You really, you really do need to manage the whole portfolio all the way from coal to wind and, and the renewables. Um, and if we get the strategic organization done right, then you can move forward into um, you know, advocating throughout the world uh, and leading throughout the world on this very, very important uh, subject that, that affects energy for everyone, but also our climate and everything else. So, it's a big way for the United States to leave, lead dramatically in the 21st century, but the first thing we have to do, I think, is get our house in order. Well, let's talk about getting our house in order for um, uh, a bit. Um, uh, first of all, I'll, now I'm gonna play um, uh, the right-wing ideologue. This is America, General. We don't have strategies for anything. That's, that's the beauty of America. The government doesn't have a strategy for business. Business figures out what they do. The invisible hand does it. We don't, you know, when we get into um, economic planning, we're moving in the path 
toward, uh, you know, toward Russia. We don't, we don't do that. Or, or China. Or China. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, 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 I certainly recognize that, and I certainly wouldn't uh, dispute that. Uh, I agree with the fact that we generally do strategic thinking rather poorly, but somehow we muddle through. But this, 20, this 21st century that we're now in is the one that we created largely in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. We advocated for other countries to be like us, to compete with us, to, uh, you know, to try to bring the private sector to the fore and, uh, and compete fairly. And uh, of course, we don't like it when other countries have a very, very close parallel between their, their government and their business sector. And in some cases, it's not distinguishable. And I do not advocate that that's where we, we should go. But in the case of energy, for example, there is absolutely nothing wrong. As a matter of fact, I think it's, it's highly desirable for the public and the private sectors to come together and recognize that you need an overarching policy, but it, ha it shouldn't be too restrictive. It shouldn't choke off. You know, the, the winners and the losers will be, will be determined by the free market. And if, you can, if, you can, if we can do that, and I think we can, and I think the Bipartisan Policy Council report generally uh, lays that forward. And by the way, with the complete agreement of the, of the private sector that was represented around the table. So if you read that report, you'll see a way, not necessarily the only way, but a way in which you can a, have a strategy that doesn't restrict, that doesn't, that doesn't limit uh, the private sector involvement and allows the, the, the free market to, to compete and succeed. It's interesting, it's with the three subjects we've discussed today, one is export, the other one is energy, and the third is education, where the old model of like, you know, each guy for themselves, the, the you know, right. government stay far away, um, just won't work, in my opinion. Uh, we absolutely need private sector involvement and more than that. They need to be the drivers and leaders, but we need an integrated strategy on education. We absolutely need one on energy. We have one, we should have one, and I think we have one on defense. So this is a place where there is a strong coordination, private sector, mm -hmm government, et cetera. So it does work, it, it can work. I think that just because we didn't do it in the past is definitely not a good reason to not do it on a go forward basis. The world has changed. I mean, we see it every day. There are people all over the world, as the general said, trying to be just like us and playing the game a little bit differently, a little bit more swiftly, a little bit better point of view. So I think, you know, I really get frustrated with the, my God, that's not the way that, the, that America was made. I said, it wasn't the way that America was made, but now we're remaking it. Um, just on yeah. that point, can I say, just on education, I think is a great example of, of, uh, of, of sort of the middle ground, right? So, it, you know, Germany is doing pretty well economically. It's not, you know, it's not China. There's a free market, et cetera. Germany has had for, you know, decades a real partnership between the elementary school system, higher education system, and their businesses. And so they very much have a system that trains that, that really drives a workforce, creates a workforce of high-end manufacturing. You know, they have engineers, um, well-paid engineers, and their education system is very much partnered with the, with the private sector to figure out the human capital needs of the private sector um, and drives the education system in that direction. Does everyone force to do certain things? No, no, no. They direct them more than we would direct them, but there is that kind of partnership. And I think when we look at our higher education system, our community college system, those are some models that we may want to learn from because you know, we continually hear from the private sector that we have huge gaps. There are huge areas where there are people in Silicon Valley who want to hire engineers and can't find them, et cetera. Um, but maybe if there was more of a strategic partnership, not you were directing anyone, but a strategic partnership between our public and private sector on some of these issues, um, we, could, we could be more productive overall. Sure. There are um, geopolitical issues on the planet right now that have private sector solutions. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if you can bring those two together, the United States can, can retain its position of preeminence in, well into the 21st century. So give an example of that. Well, you've got, a, you've got a, uh, an issue right now between, uh, between Turkey, Baghdad, Washington, and Erbil in Kurdistan. And it all has to do with the transmission of oil and gas. Um, Turkey would like to um, wean itself from its dependence on Russian energy. They would like a pipeline 
from the northern part of Iraq into, the, into Turkey and into the Mediterranean. Erbil, the, the semi-autonomous uh, government of the uh, Kurdish regional, uh, of the Kurdish region, uh, for its own reasons, would like to have that pipeline built also because they get 17% of all the revenues uh, that go through right. any pipeline. And Baghdad, I think, has an interest in uh, getting its 83% uh, of that, and they could, they could announce a pipeline being built from Baghdad to, to the Mediterranean. And Washington has a strategic interest in kind of being the arranger uh, and the proposer, so what's, if you will. So it and, sounds and, easy. And, and so I'm just giving you a, yeah. a scenario that could, if, if all the players chose to play nice geopolitically, would have huge economic uh, ramifications for the entire region. And it could be that American companies will participate in, uh, in that kind of development. So Michael, uh, retaining and attracting talent, particularly uh, non-American talent, you want to talk yeah. about that or do you want to talk about some? No, I'm, 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 I'd, I'd like to talk about that. I mean, I guess I share the, the, the views of the panel that it would be nice to come up with an umbrella solution to, to this issue. Uh, based on our success in coming up with umbrella solutions to any issue, right. uh, I, I am, uh, I, I'm dubious. Now, it's something we need to work on to be sure, but I think it's going to be difficult to accomplish. But I do think there are some micro steps that one can take that, that can significantly improve uh, our situation. Uh, last uh, year at this time, at this, at this conference, Rahm Emanuel was here mm -hmm. talking about a, a partnership between uh, the community colleges in Chicago, uh, the businesses in Chicago, trade associations, unions, et cetera, that was really focused on changing the curriculum of those community colleges to uh, specifically focus on not only the jobs today, but the jobs of the future. Uh, I gather that that is moving along. It's promising. It's early days. Uh, but there's an example of a fairly localized approach that hopefully will, will generate some uh, you know, some, 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 some good success. Uh, we have this uh, odd situation where 757, sorry, 750,000 uh, of our uh, students and universities are foreign. And approximately half of them are from China and India. Uh, you will not be surprised to learn that uh, many of them focus on uh, science, uh, math, technology, uh, subjects that unfortunately uh, have not been in vogue uh, in, in the U.S. for some time. So we need those jobs, as we've talked about. But uh, we grant every year, I want to say, 78,000 H-1B visas. So there are 750,000 students that we attract that come to our great universities uh, that uh, we would find difficult, you know, what well, we find difficult to. Uh, uh, to retain, given, given that situation. It, but it gets worse than that. Uh, of that number of visas, uh, basically no country can take more than 7%. So we've got India and China, 50% uh, of the students in, uh, in our universities, uh, yet uh, constrained because of that 7% uh, uh, limitation. Uh, and again, their focus is on precisely the skills uh, that we need. Uh, we've got so why doesn't this, I mean, people have been talking about this for years. So this, this would seem like the easiest problem in the world to solve. And actually no one's, not too many, either party is against H-1B you know, visas. So what is the problem? Well, what's the problem with trying to figure out our economic problem? <laughs> Seems pretty obvious, isn't it? Well, I'm, I'm asking you to answer it. I, I, could, yeah. I could answer it, but uh, uh, I want you to answer it. Okay, well, I... I you know, would that I knew. I mean, I think the facts are, uh, are, are, are pretty straightforward. I mean, is there the political will? Is there the, uh, uh, you know, the courage to take some of this stuff on? I mean, thus far, not. I, there was a discussion, I guess, uh, last year uh, in, in the House about uh, basically, I think it was called uh, STEM, S-T-E-M, uh, about giving 78,000 uh, uh, H-1B visas specifically to foreign graduates or universities providing that they majored in math, science, et cetera. Now, that strikes me as very sensible. Did, did, you know, is, it, is it law? I don't think, I don't, you know, I don't think it, it is law. Not yet. 
But uh, actually, I mean, they're coming it's close to, to it. It's pretty close to a deal. Okay, but okay, let me just give you and give all of you a little indication of sort of how this town works. So this is something that everybody thinks, okay, this is a good idea, right? Mm -hmm. But there's a little bit of a problem. And the little bit of a problem is that half of these visas go to Indian firms that use them to bring Indian um, graduates mm -hmm. over here to spend one or two years working in a call center at very low wages so then they can go back um, and be able to do call centers back home. So all we need is for to be quite frank about it, mm -hmm. your friends in the Republican Party to say, okay, we won't do that. <laughs> okay. By what? You know, it, it's, <laughs> it's just okay. not, that, it's not that simple or that it's, straightforward. It really isn't. I mean, I, I think. Well, what's, what's more complicated? That seems to be what's, what's causing the, to not to do this very simple thing, which is we don't want those visas to be used by, by outsourcing, Indian outsourcing firms. We want it to be used for just the purpose that Mike said. The issue is, is broader than that, unfortunately. Okay. I th I, by the way, I think this is a problem very much like the problem the general was talking about, that with a little bit of political will you could solve. I mean, this is not rocket science right. by any stretch of the imagination. We know who the people are. We know what kinds of jobs we want them to be in. Sta staple of now, here's the problem. You have a whole bunch of other people who are interested in other immigration issues. Right. Right. So the, the, the high-skilled immigration issue, we all look at it and we go, OK, clear. We just keep these guys here. But then there's the low-skilled immigration issue, right. which is a big disaster. And nobody's going to give on the high skill without some trading of the low. So we're going to hold this hostage until we get this. That, so everything a is a hostage that. now, yeah. right? And, that's, and it's part of of the discussion that we were having a little bit earlier that it's not problems. We're not discussing always the problem. We're discussing the deal, right? Yeah. And, and this whole thing about the deal gets, I think everybody, it's, it's like, what, what are we talking about? Let's just fix the problems. But it's not easy to do that. You know Washington, as you said, better than anybody on this panel. Right. So. I mean, you guys both said we, we need an export strategy that needs to be have more government business participation. The general talked about we need someone who was really at the table, in the inner table of the White House, who represents business, okay? So Jeff Zients comes up with a report and says, let's take USTR, and let's take commerce, and let's take a few export controls and a few other agents, and put them all under one cabinet officer who has real clout yep. um, and is the economic development director of the United States the way most governors are, have, are economic develop directors of their states, and let, them be, let this person be there at the table. And what is the immediate reaction of the two ranking members of the mm -hmm. Senate Finance Committee? No, we will oppose that until, until we die because it would mean that my committee loses jurisdiction over the USTR. And so that's why this won't get done. Now, how is it that we get this system out of these sort of petty, narrow things to focus on the big issues? Because, you know, the, as you all say, none of this stuff is all that complicated. We, we could do this. How do we do this? I mean, I think part of the, peop part of the issue is that we all elect some of these guys. We all, yeah, we do. So. <laughs> Part of what we have, I mean, asking us for. I think we actually all let go. I'm sorry, are you a Democrat? I, I'm, I'm a centrist. You know what I am? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I am perhaps the only living Rockefeller Republican. Yeah. Uh, actually, I'm a, yeah, I'm, I'm a salt and stall Republican from Massachusetts. Oh, it's the same <laughs> thing. It's the same thing. Okay. Nice, but we're nice, now both. Nice to meet you, yeah. <laughs> But uh, anyway, so we don't have a party, so we had to join one. I had to join one of the others. But uh, 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 so you know, this is this is getting to be a real problem. When we if we can't do the easy ones, um, there are actually hard issues. But if we can't do the easy ones, then we we really sort of um, have a problem, General. But, uh, I think there's there are things that the administration can do. With I mean, uh, obviously, it's great to consult with Congress and everything, but they can do for, in the interests of the country. And these kinds of reorganizations of the, of the deck plates, if you will, um, are good. I mean, and they have to be done because they, they, they reflect the environment that we're in. And the surest sign of decline for a company or a country is when it can't change itself to meet the environment that they're in and they don't compete. Yeah. Um, and, and there are a lot of people that are calling 
that are labeling this era the decline of the United States. And I, I don't believe that. We've always managed to uh, figure out uh, ways out of previous predicted declines. But this is a serious, this is a serious moment. And, and we have opportunities to do the right things, and we have to do them. And with all due respect uh, to, to the Congress, uh, you know, the, somebody gave me some advice years ago that in Washington, if you want to, if you want to succeed, you should be for what's going to happen. And, and the private sector is going to force this to happen, one way or the other. I, I mean, I, I don't want to have us all be completely cynical by uh, this conversation. I mean, I think that uh, immigration is a reform is an area in which there are optimistic signs. I think mm -hmm. there, if there's any issue that will be resolved, it will be immigration reform, and there will be an H-1B resolution. It may not be the perfect resolution, but there will be more uh, there will be more H-1B visas, there will be more of a system, or a new, even perhaps a new system in which we'll be keeping more of the graduates uh, here. And so, look, I think that the challenge in Washington is really, you know, I think it's easy to say that people are really dumb and petty and stupid. I mean, and we seem to have evidence every day uh, of that um, uh, in, in specific examples. But, you know, I think the challenge we're really struggling with is that the parties are farther apart than they've ever been in any other era. And there are deep, uh, you know, there are deep, there are deep differences on the role of government and whether it makes any sense. I mean, you know, let's remember that we were having a debate just last year about whether we should have an export import bank. Right. You know? <laughs> and so, uh, and you know, businesses were really lined up on that, on that issue, uh, it seemed. And yet there was a really fundamental question about the role of government in, in this. And, that question about the role of government took place in an era where a lot of the world is shifting the other way. You know, they're having countries are taking their own capital and investing in industries to compete against us in a way that we, it's hard for us to win head to head. And yet the Export Import Bank was the central challenge. So I realize that we can get, um, you know, we can get uh, particularly cynical about these debates, but I do think that there's principles animating it and that the country is very polarized um, even after this election where you know one side won a lot um, of, of seats we still have uh, that level of polarization which I hope that you know but we're electing these people so that's part of the challenge you know I think that business is far from cynical about this far from cynical one of the greatest things about being in business is you don't have to spend a lot of time here because you're doing something else. <laughs> I'm serious. So if there's a problem in education, businesses engage locally <laughs> with the educational institutions and try to do the best that they can. Right? What we found is that they engage a lot. Right? <laughs> they, a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of their human capital engaged in local grade school all the way up through universities, and not necessarily effectively. So one of the things that, that we're doing is we formed this organization called Change the Equation to try to get um, companies now pointed to more effective ways to use the money that they're already using. So there, and there's a lot of work at the Business Roundtable that is doing this as well. So cynicism is not, is not the name of the game. Mm -hmm. when, you go, when you go out and actually try to operate a business or just live every day, we do work to try to solve problems. I think all that I'm saying, I think this panel is saying, is that a little help from government would be nice. But if it doesn't come, I mean, we've figured out a way to do it without without having a turbocharge behind us, but imagine if you had a turbocharge behind us. In some places we do. In exports we have a lot of work um, today to try to enable and lay a system that fundamentally helps small to large companies export more of their goods and services. That's, that's the whole goal of the President's Export Council. That's part of the goal of the XM Bank. That's, it, it is an infrastructure that can actually work. In energy, there are private companies that are literally looking saying, we're not going to wait and see if we can, we're going to debate till, till hell freezes over about a pipeline, the Keystone Pipeline. Okay, we got it. We're going to continue to explore, we're going to, so on and so forth. So I don't think that there's, that we're sitting back, and I definitely don't think that there's cynicism until we come here and start to talk about the, top, the problems here. When we go back to our home bases, mm -hmm. we just work, and we try to solve problems. Let's uh, have some questions um, from you um, of this um, very wise and experienced uh, panel. So I can, there, I can see you. So um, there's a microphone there, and she will find you over there, all the way over there. 
Oh, that's another microphone. Nope. No questions. This is always an odd process. Yeah. Hello, I'm Angela Guzman from Atlanta, Georgia. HA Management and Consulting, and I am a small business. I love what you just said. When you talked about businesses going back to their own home base and still working in their communities to be able to change the problems. You also stated that when they tried to take away Exim Bank, the businesses came together and spoke up and there was change. So, I love this panel, this is great. Why not take the same concept and use the platform of our export import and all of the businesses that are here and take on issues one at a time and let all the businesses come behind it and the money. Um, <laughs> anyone want to take a stab at that? <laughs> I mean, I could take a stab at that, but uh, it would there be very vehicle, controversial. And then, and then I'll shut up because I'm actually speaking. There is a vehicle that is um, trying to do that. Obviously, all the issues are you know, too numerous to take on, but one of the things that I'm pleased about in the current working of the Business Roundtable is that we're stepping back from you know, a million issues and trying to line up around some key issues, education, energy, um, immigration reform, and trying to get the, the voice of business, big to small, this is clearly a bigger business roundtable, right. clearly a bigger business um, forum though, big to small, uh, having a common voice a common voice and a consistent voice around key problems. So when X, XM Bank, um, when we had the silly discussion about XM Bank, business did actually weigh in very, very actively in front and behind the scenes, probably not as fast as Fred, Fred would have liked it to happen, but we did weigh in and make it very clear what, what we wanted to have happen. Mm -hmm. And we'll do that on energy as well. There's work being done on that, on education, on immigration reform. Um, so I think that there is, on cybersecurity, there are things that are um, moving forward, and it, and it just takes a long time. It, it, you know, it just takes a long time. I think the short answer to your question is that large parts of the organized business lobby in Washington became um, partisan. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Some people who ran those organizations Absolutely. decided right. they could get more if they allied themselves with the Republican caucus in the House Absolutely. of Representatives. That made it. And for a while, they did. Mm -hmm. um, but that wound up poisoning the well in a way that now makes it difficult for those business organizations to be part of the solution because they are perceived by Democrats as being in the pockets of Republicans. Um, and that's maybe beginning to change, but that has been, I would say, as an anal just analyzing that that has been a problem in recent uh, in the last decade. Um, it was a strategy that worked, and then it worked too well. Um, and now it's hard to pull back Good from point. that strategy and be so associated, the, the business organizations, to be what they usually were, which was quite bipartisan, um, and provided the political ballast for the conversation here on a lot of these issues, which tend to get sort of technical and, you know, they're not sort of the kind of issues that people talk about in the country, you know, whether how to treat H-1B visas is not something people are talking about in coffee shops in, in Muncie and in Indiana, but um, that's how those kinds of things get resolved. And um, until recently, like very recently, um, the business community wasn't providing the ballast. Um, I think they have an immigration yeah. Um, and they sat, you know, the chamber sat down with the labor unions and they, they ironed out a few things and um, uh, that, that was, but that was unusual uh, for the last 10 years. That, didn't, that conversation didn't go on 20, 30 years ago. It went on all the time. Right. Any other questions? Yeah, okay. yeah. Oh, I see. Uh, I see. Uh, hello? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm way over here. Uh, <laughs> I asked this question the other day as well. I'm, uh, since it's global, keeping the economy uh, uh, competitive in a global market 
in my opinion, you need to have a weak dollar. I think it's very important. And if you agree with that, is there anything that we can continue to do to keep the dollar at a lower rate, the rate it is, so that we can export more competitively? So this is a fairly standard argument that our currency is, is overvalued because it is the world's currency, among other things, also because um, it's better than the alternatives, but <laughs> that it causes um, a problem for us in terms of our balance uh, between imports and exports. Who agrees with that idea? I actually, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think it's very, I mean, look, some people, particularly export-oriented developing countries, have, have manipulated their currency. There is no question about it. For a country like ours to try and manipulate the dollar, I think would be very difficult indeed. Uh, and the more you do it, uh, you know, clearly exports down. We've got a lot of people that own our debt. Uh, and the notion that it becomes uh, worth less uh, over time uh, is not particularly attractive right. to them. So, so. so we might, it might help exporters in the short term, but it's, gonna, it's going to uh, be very expensive for us to, to get our, our debt financed in the future, and that they may, may more than offset the economic benefit. Yeah, I mean, it, there's, a, there's a real, there's a real uh, conflict there. Trade-off. You should be sure. Yeah. I, I, he, he covered it all. <laughs> I agree that uh, this is a place that I, as a company leader, we try to stay far away from. Yeah. It's, you know, we're going to make the best product, provide the best service, and go for it. And then somebody else can deal with the currency issues. Um, we would prefer that other countries didn't have duality in their currency or do any cur currency manipulation to, to make it unfair, fundamentally unfair. Uh -huh. And that's the only thing I call for. Everything else, let it happen, and we'll we'll play with it, and not and not get too involved with currency manipulations or movings. Okay. Um, we had some other. There's a question there. This is something I'd like Anira, if you don't mind, to comment on. It's on our education front, as you mm -hmm. were discussing. I, I just turned on the TV when I went to the hotel last night on MSNBC, and the person who came up said, "U.S. education." It's not geared towards communities. We're looking at individuals. Mm -hmm. So my family wants to see my child be the best, whereas the community is not even, it's irrelevant when it comes to educating. Whereas in some European countries, public schools is where even the richest people send their kids. Mm -hmm. Whereas here, in the community I live in, New Jersey, three quarters of our taxes go to support the school system. Yet about 60% of the people in that town send their kids to private schools. Mm -hmm. So to go to a public school, you're just wasting your time. So where are we going to change that focus to make public education the central focus so people, middle class, upper class people, would like to bring their kids into the public school where they have the power to make the teachers teach properly and get the same skills that we need for all these businesses. Um, so if you look at the American public school system and compare it to the world, uh, we do have the best, uh, our, our schools are on a continuum. So our best public schools are as good as the best schools in the world. It's just the challenge of the American system is that our worst schools <coughs> are like the schools of Kyrgyzstan, which is the worst in the world, literally the worst in the world. And, our, and the challenge we really have is that our middle schools are, are, pretty, are doing pretty poorly compared to the middle schools of Finland, Singapore, et cetera. Um, so even, so, you know, so that makes you look at what, what are the best public schools doing. And it is, it is the case that the best public schools um, in Massachusetts, in Minnesota, you know, which I would just add are, are states that are heavily unionized, states that are heavily unionized do have the best schools in the country. Um, and, but they are, they're, they're basically, often they have property taxes, and they have local support supporting them. That leads to equity issues, but they do have strong local support for the schools. And the wealthiest people in the community, as well as the middle class and not wealthy people, lower income people, all send their school kids to those schools. Um, but they're very, you know, they're high quality schools. I happened to go to one of those schools. I went to Bedford Public Schools in Bedford, Massachusetts. You know, K through 12. Every there, there was no private schools. There's some private schools in other towns, but pretty much the engineers, the CEOs from Raytheon, everyone sent their kids to the public schools. And I do think we have this challenge. Now, look, I, you can't say to a parent, 
go to an inferior school when you can afford not to, right? That's just not gonna happen in the United States of America. And as a parent, I wouldn't do that with my child. I mean, I send my kids to DC public schools, but they're good schools, the schools I send them to. Um, and if, you know, so, and I'm proud to do that. But you know, if, if kids have poor schools, parents have poor schools, we can't do that. So we have to actually improve the public school system and make it so that parents wanna send them. You see this in New York City, there's a concerted effort that there are schools in middle class neighborhoods that kids are going to PS321 in Brooklyn, high end, middle income, lower income, all send their kids to those schools. So you have to have systems where you're creating a structure where everybody's invested in the school that will build slowly over time. And then parents, wealthy parents have the option and hopefully will send their kids to those schools. And those schools work and compete as well as any other schools in the world. So, so there's a good example where we probably, at some level, you think we ought to have a strategy. And maybe we ought to have a strategy in this country where everyone sends their kids to the same school. But this is America. And that strategy can't conflict with the individual right to send your kid um, to whatever school you want to send them to. Um, you know, right. within the law. And yeah, this, is, this is sort of our problem is that you know, we, we want to have these, we, we, we sort of think we know what the solution is, but it sort of runs up against, you know, our, our sort of political philosophy. Yeah, but I don't think it's, uh, this is a, those are two. Two extremes. Uh, yeah, but they're not even on the same plane. If I, okay. <laughs> having everybody go to the same school is not the issue, rich or poor. Having every school be reasonable to go to is the issue. Right. So I don't, every public school should have a, um, a minimum standard of performance. But the argument is that in, in, unless right. everyone is invested in the schools in a personal way, the bad and the mediocre ones won't ever get better because they're on a downward spiral where anyone who can take their kid out does and, the, and that weakens the whole system around I don't agree with school. it. You don't, don't agree, agree with, with it. it? Not at all. You go to the Harlem Children's Zone. I go to the neighborhood all the time. We walk around that neighborhood. I guess pe parents are involved. Some aren't. Well, the parents are involved. Yeah, they, they, have involved. Yeah, they, they have to be involved. They have to be involved to go they to the school. To right. Somebody <laughs> has, not, maybe not a parent, somebody has to be involved right. to, for the, right. the kid to go to the school. But the, the community people go to this school in a fairly bad, when it started, now it's obviously getting better because the schools are better, in a fairly bad community. This is about, I think, as much about will and about not being embarrassed to say that we are not doing well and then saying we're going to fix it. There's literally, I mean, I, I was just watching this show, this news program about the teachers cheating, the cheating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Edit, which was interesting. I actually thought it was that the motivation, I understood their motivation, but the motivation is a little odd, right? If what you want to do is actually educate the child, if the customer is the child, then actually having the, the child, the customer, have a good result, that's not really the result. It seems, you know, kind of, it's an oxymoron, right? The problem that we have now is that we literally have a view on, I think, the wrong customer. The customer is not the teacher. The teacher is the provider of service. The customer is not the parent. The parent is the payer, right? The, the customer is that kid. And we don't have Finland. Finland is a fairly monolithic society. We have people from all over the place, speak all different languages, have all different um, backgrounds. So we have to adjust the system and define a system that actually works community by community by community. It won't be the same everywhere. It will be public, some of it will be public. Some people will send their kids to private schools, to parochial schools, that should all be there. We just have to make sure that all of them are reasonable. And the ones that we have the trouble discussing are the ones that we pay for ourselves out of taxpayer dollars. And I just say treat them very much like we treat any other problem, which is what is the problem, how are we gonna solve it, who is the customer? Who is the customer? And the customer is the child. It is not the teacher. It is not the administrators. It is not the union. It's the kids. And if we step back and think about it from that perspective, which Jeff Canada did, he said, oh, I'll figure out a way that actually serves the kids. Mm -hmm. Day, longer days, shorter days, different days, whatever it is. I just think we, we get ourselves really confused and make this political and make this, you know, we should do what Germany does. We should, we should do a lot of what these countries do. We also have to realize that we're not these countries. Yeah, but and even in our, even in states that are much more homogeneous, right? Our schools are not competing I would with the best that. in the world. I would that. Right? So I, would that. I, I, I wish, you know, 
there are lots of ingredients to the Harlem Children's Zone, and I wish every child had the Harlem Children's Zone. I think the issue with the question is, if upper income families are pulling them, their children out of public schools, you see this in, in cities, uh, it, it does leave fewer taxpayer dollars for those resources. So how do you make those schools attractive for, you know, and then the, bottom, you know, then the schools decline. So how do you make those schools more attractive um, to do that? And I, I absolutely agree, the best way to do that is to always focus on what the child is learning Right, that is the number one agreement, that, and that's the number one standard. But how do we get there, I think, is the issue that politics involves itself in. So um, let's thank our panel. We're uh, at the end of our time.